So having just examined these eight characteristics, we have determined conclusively that the Antichrist power will speak great blasphemies by claiming to be God and by claiming the ability to forgive sins. It will reside in an area of seven mountains or hills. It is a union of both the church and state power. It will be adorned or clothed in purple and scarlet. It will claim that God's law has been changed. It will have power to persecute Christians or God's people for 1,260 years. And after this reign of persecution, it will cease to have power for a period and then will come back to power and lead the world into perdition or destruction. Now, if you think you know who the Antichrist is, I want to remind you that I have not told you who it is. You came to that conclusion on your own. All I've done so far is have just explained the meaning of the symbols according to the Bible's own definitions. So if you have chosen an entity that you believe fits all these characteristics, it is because the Bible has revealed this to you and not me. And as you can see, when you allow the Bible to define its own symbols, then these prophecies truly do become a revelation. If you're still not quite sure who all these prophecies might apply to, that's okay. There are 24 characteristics the Bible gives us by which we can identify the Antichrist. But allow me to quote the most well-known Protestant reformers as they all agreed who the Antichrist was and have wrote their conclusions in no uncertain terms. Martin Luther, perhaps the most well-known of all Protestant reformers for nailing his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church, wrote in 1520, We here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Personally, I declare that I owe the Pope no other obedience than that to Antichrist. He also wrote, I rejoice in having to bear such ills for the best of causes. Already I feel greater liberty in my heart, for at last I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. John Wesley, the great Methodist reformer, said of the papacy, he is in an emphatical sense the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is, too, properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. He it is that exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, claiming the highest power and highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. The well-known Presbyterian John Calvin wrote, Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman Pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. Charles Spurgeon wrote, It is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist, and as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God.
why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Where are the seven hills? When you are young among the seven hills of Rome, The Greek word for mountain is oros, which can mean mountain or hill. And there's only one city in world history that has become famous as the city of seven hills, and that city is Rome. If you study history, you'll discover that for nearly 400 years, Protestant scholars applied Revelation 17 verse 9 to the Roman Catholic Church, whose headquarters is inside the city of Rome. They didn't apply this to godly Catholic people, that's important to know, millions of whom exist today, but to the Roman Catholic system whose doctrines have strayed far away from the Bible and from simple faith in Jesus Christ and in his love for full salvation. But some have objected and they say that if you really look close at the seven hills of Rome, which are right next to the Tiber River, the Vatican actually sits on the other side of the Tiber, so it's not technically on the seven hills. Are you ready for the truth? Here it is. The official seat of the popes isn't in the Vatican. It's on one of the seven hills called Caelian Hill, and it's inside a large world-famous church called the Arc Basilica of St. John Lateran. That church is the oldest church in Rome, Originally, it was a palace belonging to a Roman family, and it was taken over by Emperor Constantine shortly after he rose to power in the 4th century. Before Constantine moved his seat of government to the east, to Constantinople, he gave that palace to the popes, who then put a throne inside of it and made it their throne, or their seat, for nearly a thousand years. Even today, although the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church is in the Vatican on that side of the Tiber River, its official seat or throne is still inside the Arc Basilica of St. John Lateran. On the front wall of this Arc Basilica is a plaque with words in Latin, which translated into English say that that church, which is the official seat of the popes today, is, quote, the mother and the head of all churches in the city and in the world. It's one of the great churches of Rome because it's the Pope's um, see church. So our word see there from the Latin sedes, meaning chair or seat, a cathedra in Greek. So cathedral comes from that, means the seat of the bishop. So even though the Pope lives over near St. Peter's, and that's a great basilica, this is actually his cathedral church. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. What does a woman symbolize in the Bible? I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So here we see God refer to the church as a woman. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 
What does harlotry symbolize in the Bible? Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Or a woman that is a harlot symbolizes an apostate church. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. What does a beast symbolize in the Bible? The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. So here we see in the Bible that a beast symbolizes a kingdom. This is the world's smallest country. The Vatican City State is less than half a square kilometer in size and home to around 800 people, one of whom is the Pope. The pontiff is not only the head of state, but is also head of the government of the Catholic Church, known as the Holy See. This institution has existed for the best part of two millennia and represents over one billion baptized Catholics worldwide. An old and secretive entity, the Holy See acts as a surprisingly powerful player in global diplomacy. Vatican City is the only church and state nation in the world. It is known as the City on Seven Hills, and its primary colors are purple and scarlet. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. During the Protestant Reformation, many of the reformers, including Thomas Cranmer, John Wesley, William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, Felipe Melanchthon, John Huss, Martin Luther, and hundreds of others all concluded the papacy was the harlot of Babylon identified in the scriptures. Catholic Church, and right over there is the Ten Commandments. So let's see what they say. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Now notice how this Catholic version of the Ten Commandments removes the Second Commandment that forbids the making of graven images, bowing down to them or serving them, and replaces it with the Third Commandment. And then it divides the Tenth Commandment that forbids coveting into two separate commandments so that they can maintain the appearance of having Ten Commandments. All you have to do is read Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 21 and you will clearly see that the Roman Catholic Church has changed God's holy law, and whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 1957, page 50. Okay, so we're not keeping the Lord's Day, we're keeping the Catholic Day, which they call the Lord's Day, without one doctrinal, one verse in favor of their argument. Let's see what the Reformers used to say. Let's go back to the Reformation. Melanchthon, the meek and mild friend of Martin Luther, quoting on Daniel 7 verse 25, and the spelling is not wrong, this is just old English. He writes, he, talking about Antichrist, he changes the times and laws that any of the six work days commanded of God will make them unholy and idle days when he lists. So if the Pope wants to, he can change a work day into a holy day. We call it that this day still, don't we? Don't we talk about a holiday? Good. All of their own holy days abolished make work days again. 
so if they want to change it around, they can do it. God says, six days shalt you labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Roman Catholic Church can change it around. Or well, when they change the Saturday into Sunday, they have changed God's laws, turned them into their own traditions to be kept above God's precepts. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday, and thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Baal, or Balder, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to Jesus, Catholic Mara. They go even further. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Father Enright, American Sentinel, 1893. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage which warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Catholic Press, Sydney. This one's really arrogant. If Protestants would follow the Bible, they should worship God on the Sabbath day. In keeping the Sunday, they are following a law of the Catholic Church. This is... Chancellor of the Arch Archdiocese of Baltimore. Protestantism in discarding the authority of the Roman Catholic Church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Daniel 7.25 says the little horn would war against God's people for a time and times and the dividing of time. To learn how the papacy fulfills his prophecy, you first need to understand how prophetic time is calculated. There are five points you need to know. Point number one, the phrase time refers to a period of one year unless otherwise specified in the prophecy, such as you see in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 16. Number two, the phrase times, which is plural, equals two years. Number three, the phrase dividing of time represents a year divided in half or half a year. By adding one year plus two years plus half a year, you get three and one half years. In other words, the little horn made war against God's people for three and a half years. But the key to understanding prophetic time is found in knowing how many days are contained in the months and years of the prophecy. Point number four. In Daniel's day, the biblical month had 30 days and the biblical year had 360 days. By multiplying 360 days by three and a half years, we learn there are 1260 days in three, in three and a half years. You can also calculate this time period by months. There are 36 months in three years and six months in half a year. This equals 42 months. Now multiply 42 months by 30 days per month and you get 1260 days. Now there's only one more step to go. Point number five. In Numbers 1434, we learn that God uses the day for a year principle. This means each prophetic day becomes one literal year. Therefore, 1260 days becomes 1260 years. So Daniel 7.25 is really saying the little horn made war against God's people for 1260 years. Our earlier videos reveal the Roman Catholic Papacy came to power in 538 AD after the Ostrogoths were ousted from Italy. Adding 1260 years to 538 AD brings you to the year 1798. In that year, Napoleon's General Berthier marched into Rome, took the Pope prisoner, and proclaimed the political rule of the papacy at an end. The Pope later died in exile. Thus, the papacy ruled from 538 to 1798, exactly 1260 years as predicted in the Holy Bible. During this time known as the Dark Ages, historians report the Catholic Church was responsible for the deaths of millions of people. 
This deadly wound, which the papacy received in 1798, put an end to its political rule along with its persecution against God's people. Now here's how Daniel unlocks Revelation. This time period of 1260 years is mentioned twice in Daniel and five times in the book of Revelation. In the King James Bible, they appear as the following phrases, time and times and the dividing of time, which is three and a half years, or as 42 months, which is also three and a half years, or as a thousand two hundred and three score days. By the way, a score equals 20, so three score equals 60. This is 1260 days. All three of these time periods are the same. Whenever you see one of these three phrases in Daniel or Revelation, you can know God is speaking about the Little Horn Power, the Roman Catholic Papacy, who made war with God's people for 1260 years. You can find these verses in Daniel 7.25 and 12.7. In Revelation, they are in Revelation 11.2, 11.3, 12.6, 12.14, and chapter 13, verse 5. Study these chapters with this information in mind, and your understanding of Revelation will come alive with a desire to learn more. If this information is not clear, please pray and ask God to help you understand it, because it's very important for you to have the correct understanding of Revelation. After all, the book is titled, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now let's look at the next point. Did the Roman Catholic Church have power to make war with, persecute, and overcome the saints for 1,260 years? The papacy's power became supreme in Christendom in 538 AD due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian, known as Justinian's Decree, which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches. It gave the papacy political power, civil power, as well as ecclesiastical power. This letter became part of Justinian's Code, the fundamental law of the empire, and the year Pope Vigilius ascended the throne under the military protection of Belisarius. In 538 AD, the Church of Rome emerged as the head of both the church and the civil territories that made up the fallen Roman Empire, and continued to rule and have power to make war with the saints for 1,260 years. And this period is known as the Dark Ages, and the civil reign of the papal power ended in 1798. In 1798, General Berthier made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. This was the fulfillment of the Antichrist's reign over the saints of God for 1,260 years. Then from 1798 to 1929, the papal power ceased to have any civil power or presence. Then, in 1929, the Roman Catholic Church re-emerged the San Francisco Chronicle on February 11, 1929, wrote, The Roman question tonight is a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document healing the wound of many years. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. The New York Times reported from 11 o'clock this morning there was another sovereign independent state in the world. At that time, Premier Mussolini as Italian foreign minister representing King Victor Emmanuel, the first Italian premier ever to cross the threshold of the Vatican, exchanged with Cardinal Gasperi, Papal Secretary of State representing Pope Pius XI, ratifications of the treaties signed at the Lateran Palace on February 11. By that simple act, the sovereign independent state of Vatican City came into existence. And with this, the last characteristic of the Antichrist is fulfilled that the Antichrist would be a church and state power that was, is not, and yet is. It was, or existed, from 538 to 1798, having both civil and religious authority. And then it was not, from 1798 to 1929. And after 1929, it yet is. And it is in the yet is stage of its existence, after 1929, that it was foretold, it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. And in fulfillment of this prophecy, and the eight characteristics that we have looked at, the world today is indeed wondering, 
or admiring and following after the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist. Buonasera. The pontiff is not only the head of state, but is also head of the government of the Catholic Church, known as the Holy See. This institution has existed for the best part of two millennia. He's captured the imagination, not just of the world's 1.2 billion Catholics, but the world itself. I get it on the streets. I mean, everybody from the bartender to the cab driver telling me, uh, Cardinal Dolan, we love this guy. His Twitter account, at Pontifex, ranks in the top five most searched words on the internet. He walks the streets, poses for pictures, embraces the sick, and is not afraid to have a bit of fun. Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google. Donald Trump, President of the United States. Vladimir Putin, President of Russia. Leonardo DiCaprio, Hollywood movie star. Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Elizabeth II, Queen of England. Pope Francis has just endorsed same-sex unions for the very first time. And the leading gay magazine, The Advocate, have named him their Person of the Year.